Hello everyone. Welcome to the checkup with Google Health and welcome to my home. I'm Dr. David Feinberg. On behalf of everyone at Google, we hope you're well, staying safe, and taking care of yourself and each other. For those of you not familiar with Google Health, we're a team of doctors, nurses, engineers, and more. Our goal is to build on Google's mission of organizing the world's information and apply that mission to health. We wanna make health information more accessible and useful to everyone everywhere, from doctors who need to quickly find an important piece of information in your medical history, to anybody juggling a full-time job while caring for kids and aging parents, and in the developing world where mobile technology and AI can transform care so that we can all live our healthiest lives. During this hour, we'll share the work we're doing to improve access to care, the tools we're building to make an impact on health equity, and the innovative ways we're using mobile technology so that you can take control of your health. You'll hear from members of the Google Health team and some of our industry-leading healthcare partners, such as Ascension, NHS, Mayo Clinic, and India's Sankara Eye Hospital. I've been at Google for two years now, and I'm certain that our technology can save lives. Yet in the 30 years I've been practicing medicine, I've learned that there are two things we need to get right. First, our tools must help the doctors and nurses who care for you. And second, we have to earn your trust. Your private information will be kept private, period. If the events of the last year have taught us anything, it's that staying healthy is important not only to us as individuals, but also to society as a whole. And we've learned that having easy access to information we need at exactly the time we need it empowers us to navigate challenging times with more confidence. So let's begin with the biggest health story of our time, COVID-19. Please join me in welcoming my colleague, Dr. Karen DeSalvo to the checkup to tell us about Google's COVID-19 response. Thank you, David. Well, hello, everyone. Helpfulness has always been at the heart of Google's mission. And so since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, we wanna share some of the ways that we've been helping. We have launched more than 200 products and features and contributed more than a billion dollars in resources to help our users, our partners, everyone to get through this pandemic. I wanna highlight a few of the areas we've been focused on before we broaden the conversation. You've probably heard the news about Google's collaboration with Apple. We announced this last April and it's a combined effort using Bluetooth technology to help government and health agencies slow the spread of the virus. That partnership resulted in exposure notification apps that are used to alert you if you've been in contact with someone who's tested positive for COVID. These apps are available in more than 50 countries and the research is showing that it's helping to save lives. Over the past year, we've been working closely with the World Health Organization, the CDC, and others to provide trusted, authoritative inf information for the public. When you search on COVID-19, you'll see official information from these public health entities about symptoms, prevention, treatments, and references like maps and graphs to orient you to the state of the pandemic. Last September, we released the COVID-19 Search Trends Symptoms Dataset, which includes search trends for more than 400 symptoms. This data has been helping researchers and public health study the link between symptom-related searches and the spread of COVID-19. And finally, the Community Mobility Report use the same type of anonymized aggregated insights we use in products like Google Maps and these reports help chart movement trends over time. We've made them available in 135 countries and 64 languages, and they're helping researchers and public health to better understand and forecast the impact of the pandemic on a global stage. We know your privacy is essential, and our technology allows us to share trends and insights without sharing personal information. This is just a bit of what we're doing across Google in response to the pandemic, and there's plenty more that we'd like to share. So I wanna open up the conversation. Today, I've invited my colleagues and friends, Drs. Garth Graham and Rob Califf to talk about our health initiatives in the pandemic that YouTube and another part of the Alphabet company, Verily, have been engaged in. 
They're two of my favorite people, and I hope you enjoy hearing from them this today. So let's start with Garth. Um, what's happening over there with you all at YouTube? How are you getting accurate and up-to-date information to users? Thank you, Karen. And we really have come together across the enterprise to tackle the very serious issues with the pandemic. YouTube, as you know, has become one of the most important sources of information for the public. With 2 billion monthly users, it's really important to sort fact from fiction. That's why when the pandemic happened, we moved quickly to update our policies so we could remove false content like claims that COVID is a hoax or things along those lines. In fact, we've removed more than 700,000 videos related to dangerous or misleading COVID-19 medical information. We've also gone beyond that. We're partnering with trusted sources in the medical and public health community, like the Harvard School of Public Health, the American Public Health Association, the National Academies of Medicine and Mayo Clinic to get the latest information out to users. We're putting this authoritative content on COVID-19 information panels that you'll find on the YouTube homepage, on videos, and in search results. But would you like to guess how many times these panels have been viewed? Over 400 billion times so far. That number is amazing every time I hear it. Garth, you have devoted so much of your career to creating parity in health and healthcare. And among your many influential roles, you orchestrated the U.S. government's very first national health disparities plan. So I want you to tell us how you're doing work at YouTube that will allow you to connect with audiences that are historically hard to reach, including communities of color. Maybe you could start with an example of how you've been working with Dr. Fauci. That's an area that um, you've pushed us a lot, you know, in terms of making sure we're reaching underserved communities and communities overall. And we've actually managed to pull off a lot of unlikely pairing of bedfellows, um, to use the terminology. And one of those examples is we paired Trevor Noah from The Daily Show, who has a very popular audience, a very popular voice. And we paired him with Dr. Fauci as a source of science. And it worked really well because Trevor asked the tough questions that his fans, his audience were um, thinking and really got, got an idea of just how effective these types of interviews can be. The Trevor Noah Fauci interview actually got close to 12 million views. So we know that these uh, personalities um, are trusted voices um, for, um, for their communities. And um, it's really important for YouTube to connect these known personalities with leading health experts to reach people where they are. And, and I really consider this Public Health 101. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much, Garth. Uh, you and your team are doing really important work for the public's health. Rob, I I'd like to turn to you now so you can tell us about the work that Verily's Project Baseline has been doing during the pandemic. It's certainly in the beginning and even now not easy for everyone to get a COVID test, and you've partnered with some pretty big names to test millions of people. So can you tell us more about that? Thanks, Karen. It's been great working with you, Garth, and the whole Google Health team. This has really been a tremendous effort. Verily has been able to use this baseline platform to test millions of people in community testing clinics. And we've done this across 16 states in partnership with organizations like Rite Aid. More than 100,000 people have opted into our COVID-19 research, and we've been able to recruit participants for research on therapies and vaccines to address the critical issues about the pandemic. Yeah, you know, Rob, you and the team at Verily are often three steps ahead of everybody else. And um, your testing programs are a good example of that, because even as uh, you have been developing individual testing, Verily has stepped up to develop reopening strategies. So can you tell us how that evolved and how you plan to use it in the future? Well, Karen, a great byproduct of our work in COVID-19 testing and screening is that we gain valuable insights and data were collected that we use to develop operations and predictive models to help employers and university presidents open their um, institutions. Now we're using those tools to work with these businesses and universities to see if we can help them uh, in this next phase of the pandemic as they gradually reopen and deal with vaccination. This is called our Healthy at Work program, which now has about 20 customers including several Fortune 500 employers and major universities. We've made great progress with this first batch of businesses, their workforce and student force, 
and we've got more planned launches coming this year. It's great to hear, Rob. When you talk about COVID-19 testing, um, sometimes people hear high sensitivity and pooled testing as kind of some of the characteristics or methods that are important to use. Could you explain in layman's terms what those mean and how they're helping Verily to get more accurate tests and also how to cut costs? Sure, let me break it down this way. Pool testing is simply taking samples like nasal swabs or blood draws from dozens to hundreds of people and only running a single test instead of individual tests. We can then use mathematical algorithms to give us the ability to run many fewer assays and still decipher who is infected out of a group of people. High sensitivity tests are basically more accurate tests, which help to reduce the number of false positives. Together, these approaches reduce costs and make better use of supplies. This has all been published in the Met Archives and is publicly available in blogs. It's fantastic. Thank you, Rob, and, thank, and congratulations to the team. You guys should be really proud. So I want to sh take a shift and talk about vaccines, which is on the top of the mind for just about everybody. Um, Google recently announced an investment of $150 million to promote education and equity in access to vaccines uh, for everyone. And we want to make it easier for people to find vaccine sites on search and maps. And we're uh, making our own office spaces available uh, as vaccination sites across the country and across the world, if that's useful. So Rob and Garth, um, in, in the topic of vaccines, I want to come back to the both of you so we can hear more about what your teams have been doing uh, in regards to vaccinations for the U.S. and the world. Garth, let me start with you. Thanks, Karen. And again, this is an area that you have pushed us on to make sure we're dealing appropriately with issues around equity. And one of the biggest challenges with the vaccine is getting the word out to underserved communities. And to do that, we're partnering with public health agencies and community-based organizations, including HBCUs like Morehouse School of Medicine and organizations like the CDC Foundation. These organizations are helping people and communities, particularly underserved communities, including people of color and people living in rural America, get access to the vaccine in the same way as everyone else and educating folks along the way. I think it's really important to recognize the team effort that you and others as part of the Google Health family have assembled here to really tackle some of these very important issues around equity and helping people find accurate and timely information on vaccines. Karen, did you want to share more about that from your end? I do. Thank you, Garth. Our team looked at Google search trends and found that searches for vaccine near me have been increasing by five times since the beginning of the year. So to answer that need, we're focusing on making it easier for people to find when they're eligible to receive a vaccine. To do this, we've expanded information panels on search to more than 40 countries, and we're adding local distribution information in search and maps. And we've just launched the Get the Facts initiative. Get the Facts is all about getting authoritative, evidence-based information out to the world via Google and YouTube. And I'm grateful to partners like vaccinefinder.org and Boston Children's Hospital, government agencies and retail pharmacies who are helping us get the authoritative piece right. So Rob, um, Google's technology, specifically AI, is being used for some pretty important steps throughout the supply chain process for vaccines. Um, this includes everything from traffic and weather forecasting, uh, as well as ensuring safe delivery of the vaccine. Could you give us some more details on that kind of work? You bet, Karen. We all know how important logistics are for getting more vaccine into arms. You could say we're obsessed with it now. Google Cloud has developed sophisticated supply chain systems to help states and counties deliver vaccines more efficiently. When better supply logistics are coupled with the kind of information you and Garth have described, it's a big help uh, in this overwhelming time. Thanks, Rob. Um, so listen, one of the joys of my career um, is to work with brilliant people like the both of you and the many people on our teams. And I just want to say how grateful I am that we can contribute our skills, our experience um, and other assets of our company to help bring an end to this pandemic. I want to thank all of the essential workers on the front lines every day, uh, those in hospitals, in grocery stores, schools and research labs and many more. We're all in this together and we want you to know that you're on our minds as we do our work. I'm gonna leave you now with my colleague, Paul. He's gonna share more on work that we're doing to organize healthcare data. 
so that it's useful not only to doctors and clinicians, but to all of us. Thank you, Karen. You know, healthcare professionals are healers, not data clerks. Yet today, many spend half their day on a computer navigating their EHRs and other systems. Since a patient's health records are sometimes scattered across multiple systems, getting a full picture of a patient takes a valuable time, energy, and resources. The tools we're developing for health systems, like our collaboration with Ascension, aim to make health information more accessible and useful. We're committed to understanding the unique challenges clinicians face, as well as the concerns and preferences of their patients. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Richard Fogel, Chief Clinical Officer at Ascension, to dig into the potential clinical impact of our work. Dr. Fogel, welcome to the program. Uh, let's start with the taking a step back. When we think about organizing information, what challenges have you and your clinicians been facing that prompted your company to seek a tech solution? Thanks, Paul. You know, I've, I've been a doctor for a little bit more than 30 years now. And when we started out, we were using paper records. And if you saw a patient for the first time or the second time, the chart was relatively slim. But as you saw the patient longer and longer, the chart got bigger and bigger and bigger. And frankly, finding information in that chart got harder and harder. It became like a scavenger hunt. Around 20 years ago or so, we converted to digital format. We converted to electronic health records. And you would think that that would have made the process easier. And in fact, it did make it easier, but it still created a problem. You see, the way that electronic health records or paper charts were organized are they're organized in different sections. And very often we want to find a specific piece of information and there's not, and the, the piece of information is in a section, but it's not the only piece of information in the section. So for example, I'm a cardiologist. I'd like to find an echocardiogram or all the echocardiograms that a patient has had over time. Echocardiograms are typically in the imaging section, but so are chest x-rays and CT scans and MRIs and many other imaging tests. So often, even in today's electronic health records, what I have to do is I have to sort through that imaging section to find the exact information that I want to see. That can be very time consuming and can take me away from being with you, the patient. And we, we began to think there just had to be a better way. Finding data like that can be really difficult. And so one of the key things we're doing here is, you know, our teams are creating a harmonized and normalized view of data across multiple systems. Now, thinking about this multi-system view, why is that so important? What are the risks associated with relying on a silo data? If everyone worked on the same electronic health record or the same database underlying the electronic health record, that would be great and that would make things a lot easier. But that's not the current reality. There are multiple different electronic health record systems and information comes into it in many different ways. Sometimes it comes in digitally, sometimes it's scanned, sometimes it's faxed. It becomes a mishmash of different types of data and that mishmash makes it really difficult to really understand what's going on and get a complete picture of the patient. The reality is the better picture of the patient that I can get, the better the, Im the information is organized, the better care I can give you as a doctor, the better I can present you with information and options, and the better choices we can make together for the betterment of your healthcare. Agreed. So let's say we now have all this data in one place, and we've done the hard work to normalize it and made it searchable. How does it actually plug into the day-to-day -day workflow for clinicians? How does it enable you, you to deliver better care? So... When I see a patient, or I think when most docs see patients, we typically see patients in the outpatient setting in the office on every 15 minutes or every 20 minutes or so. So in my particular workflow, what I like to do is I like to review the record before I go in and see the patient. I like to see how the patient was, do was doing the last time. And then I like to see if there were any updates to the patient's condition. The more efficient I can do that, the more time I can spend with the patient. If I'm seeing patients every 20 minutes or so, and it takes me five minutes to review all the information, including all the new information which has come in, then I have 15 minutes with the patient. But if it takes me seven or eight or 10 minutes with the patient and I have a 20 minute appointment book, I can see the patient in only 10 minutes. So it takes time away. So the more the information is brought together, the easier it is for me to integrate the information for me to form an electronic, to form a picture in my mind of what the patient's needs are and to present that information to the patient for good decision-making. 
Some docs like to take the computer into the office with into the exam room with the patient. And one of the issues with that is if you have to search for information and you're and and you can't do it efficiently, then what can happen is you're looking down at the computer at the computer and you're not looking and not making eye contact with the patient. And it's so important to have that critical doctor patient bond that you can have by just looking at a patient and looking in looking at them in the eye and looking for all the nonverbal cues. The better the information is presented to me, the more efficient I can be, the more time I can spend with you, the better care we can give, and the better decisions we can make together. Amazing. In the end, we hope to save time with better workflows and ultimately improve outcomes by helping clinicians find that information they need to care for patients, because that's what it's all about, patient care. Thank you, Dr. Fogel, for your insights. It's an absolute pleasure working with you and your teams. Now I'm going to hand it back to David for more on our latest innovations, including better diagnosis and treatment for cancer. Thanks, Paul. Let's shift gears now to artificial intelligence, or AI. It's a complex topic, and it's referenced in a lot of different ways. As a longtime doctor turned Googler, here's my simplified take. AI is about organizing lots and lots of information so that patterns are easier to spot. Scientists then apply math to those patterns to make predictions about what's going to come next. We see the potential that AI has to help doctors and specialists become more efficient and precise, and importantly, to improve access and care for patients. Google researchers have already seen a lot of success in how AI can help to prevent blindness in people with type 2 diabetes. We'll tell you more about how that's driving real impact later in the hour. Today is World Cancer Day, and I'm sure each of us knows somebody who's been affected by cancer. More than 18 million new cancer cases are diagnosed each year, but we are making progress, and AI is one of those areas that's showing great promise. Let's take a look at how AI is improving cancer diagnosis and treatment. I've come from a family where the females have definitely had breast cancer and when I got an abnormal mammogram, I thought, yes, I've got it. I was really surprised how emotional I became on the day of the biopsy. And when the doctor was actually doing the biopsy, I just broke down into tears. And it was really a difficult day for me. A few days later, I was told that I had metastatic breast cancer, grade three. My treatment involved two operations, six cycles of chemotherapy and a course of radiotherapy. I had so many scans and procedures that it could actually fill a book. After I had finished the radiotherapy, I felt so detached. Fortunately, my breast care nurse, she realized that I had post-traumatic stress and referred me to see a clinical psychologist who specializes in cancer. Unfortunately, Suzanne's condition is not unique. Breast cancer affects about one in eight women at some point in their lifetime. And right now, the treatment that follows can often be long and stressful. In many countries, X-ray screening is done for breast cancer with mammography, but the number of clinicians required to keep this going is difficult to sustain. To tackle these problems, we worked with patients like Suzanne to explore how artificial intelligence might be able to detect breast cancer in screening mammograms. Our researchers are also looking into the applications of artificial intelligence for cancer treatment, and that work begins in partnership with Mayo Clinic. We're really excited to investigate whether artificial intelligence can help in these complex processes like planning of radiotherapy. Over a half of all cancer patients receive radiation as part of their overall cancer therapy. Radiation oncology itself is a very technology-driven field, and it's ripe if not actually overdue for AI implementation. So when Google Health approached us about collaborating on AI radiation therapy, we said absolutely. Radiation therapy is used to kill cancer cells. The first thing we do is take images or scans of the patient. That way we can identify critical structures in the tumor. The radiation oncologist, based on these scans, painstakingly goes and draws all these critical structures. These would be things like your optic nerves, 
your brain stem, your spinal cord. In that way, when we upload these to our computer models, we could avoid these critical structures and just target the tumor. So this process of outlining the normal tissues as well as the cancerous tissues is called contouring. It has to be done very meticulously and that can take expert clinicians six or seven hours per case. We think artificial intelligence might have the potential to really streamline this process. We're optimistic that AI will help increase the amount of time we can spend with the treatment plan itself and for the doctors to spend with their patients. Ideally, this would eliminate that agonizing amount of time patients wait to get their cancer therapy. The hospital treatment took nine months and obviously that involved a lot of waiting for new appointments to come, waiting for the results of procedures to come. It just seemed endless and I'm sure it would have been easier if it hadn't been so long. I was very fortunate in having a breast care nurse assigned to me who was always able to give me the time that I needed. But there were certain times when I wished I'd been able to spend a little bit longer with my consultants. Patient participation really empowers our research. It brings clarity to our mission and makes sure that we're learning from those with lived experience. This new study with Mayo Clinic will not actually take place in a clinical setting. We'll be studying the use of algorithms on de-identified data, images which you cannot trace back to an individual patient. We'll be beginning by trying to assess contouring in the head and neck. We're starting with this area of the body because there are many anatomic structures squeezed into tight spaces. If we can perform this delicate and difficult task in head and neck structures, we think it should be feasible to scale up the technology to other areas of the body and benefit as many patients as possible. I'd always been aware that it is absolutely vital and crucial that patients are involved in cancer research, specifically in terms of partaking of clinical trials. Suddenly I found myself being involved actively in helping with the research and I found it actually really cathartic. It was like the cancer, instead of being so much in me, came out and I was able to use my experience to really be of use, I think, and that, I think, is empowering when you realize that you've got something to offer. Patients come to Mayo Clinic to receive the best quality care. Our collaboration with Google Health will help us increase and continue that great quality care for our community, but also for everyone around the world. We hope that with this partnership, we'll be able to not only increase the quality, but increase the access of radiation therapy to patients around the world, which will improve cancer outcomes. Google works at the cutting edge of artificial intelligence, and we believe that its applications in healthcare could assist doctors and caregivers and improve the accuracy and availability of many investigations and treatments. Our North Star is helping everyone live healthier lives, and we believe that with projects like this partnership with Mayo Clinic, we can do just that. Improve treatments for cancer patients by making the process faster, more efficient and more precise. Accurate treatment plans can be accessible for far more people around the world. Hello, I'm Sunny Virmani. AI may improve outcomes for many diseases and conditions, perhaps even prevent some. Today, there are about 415 million diabetic patients in the world, and each one is at risk of vision loss due to a terrible disease called diabetic retinopathy, also referred to as DR. We spoke to one of our key collaborators, Dr. Kim Ramasamy, with Arvind Eye Hospital in India about the disease before a pandemic. Diabetic retinopathy is a condition which affects people with diabetes. In the early stages, it's symptomless. 
but that's when it's treatable. So you want to screen them early on before they actually lose vision. In the early stages, if a doctor is examining the eye or you take a picture of the back of the eye, you will see lots of those bleeding spots in the retina. Today, the doctors are not enough to do the screening. We have very limited ophthalmologists, so there should be other ways where you can screen the diabetic patients for the diabetic complications. In the U.S., there are about 74 eye doctors for every million people. In India, there are only 11. So just keeping up with the sheer number of patients, let alone giving them the attention and care they need, is overwhelming, if not impossible. This is a huge problem. So we wondered if with the power of machine learning, we could train a model to read these eye images captured with a special camera similar to a trained eye doctor. This would allow clinics to provide access to eye care when there is a shortage of physicians. By partnering with visionaries like Dr. Kim and with Verily, we came up with a solution that we call Automated Retinal Disease Assessment, or ARDA. Using the same technology that powers Google Photos, we trained it to read retinal images that doctors had labeled for diabetic eye disease. This algorithm proved accurate, and we worked with the regulators in the EU to gain clearance in 2018. Since then, We've been working with clinics in India, Thailand, and the U.S. to see how ARDA can change the way patients receive care for diabetic retinopathy. Two of our key collaborators join us from around the world. First, Dr. Rajiv Raman from Shankara Netrale in India, and Dr. Pai San Ram Vibunsuk from Rajaviti Hospital in Thailand. Both of them have been instrumental in the development of this technology and are using it in their clinical settings today. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to be with us. My first question is for both of you. Please tell us about your experience with ARDA so far and how does it change patient care for you? Let's start with you, Dr. Rajiv. Thanks for having me, Sunny. My research team at Shankane Trale a tertiary eye care institute in Chennai was involved in the initial development and validation of ARDA. We also assessed its performance in real time. Both these studies were also published. Since 2018, ARDA is being used across many centers in India, including our hospital, and thousands of people with diabetes have been screened for retinopathy. You can use it in two modes, in a fully automatic mode at places where there is little or no expertise to grade the retinal images like a primary care physician clinic or in an assistive mode at places where there are ophthalmologists but can use it to grade retinal images with more confidence and help reduce their overall burden in providing care. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajiv. Uh, now, Dr. Paisan. Tell us about your experience with ARDA in Thailand, please. Well, um, thank you, Sunny. We validated ARDA for adaptive retinopathy screening in a retrospective data set of more than 10,000 retinal images from patients with diabetes in all healthcare regions in Thailand. And we found ARDA to be more accurate in detecting diabetic retinopathy for referral to ophthalmologists compared to the trained graders who work as retinopathy screeners in Thailand's national screening program. Now, in our prospective study, this is another study, ARDA also provided screening results to patients immediately during their visit, rather than having them wait for like weeks to get results to come back from remote ophthalmologists, as in the case in Thailand. Well, in this study, ARDA was able to detect about 15% of patients screened who had vision threatening diabetic retinopathy and referred them to have treatment. Thanks, Dr. Paisan. Uh, we've been working with you for three years now. We know building an accurate algorithm is just the first step, and we need to fully understand how to deploy any new technology in the field. What are we learning from these early deployments of using AI for diabetic retinopathy screening in Thailand? Well, thank you, Sunny. That's a very good question. Well, um, I believe an accurate algorithm 
was only the first step. It is important for the success of ARDA to ensure a seamless integration into the clinic workflow, which we did with our prospective study. Well, we also have to recognize the skill of the operators, the screeners, and patient complaints at these clinics, which may impact the quality of images used by ARDA for providing the correct diagnosis. Well, we are in the process of understanding these challenges further so we can provide a kind of clinical viable end-to-end -end solution for the screening clinics. This will also involve a key step of getting regulatory clearance for ARDA from Thai FDA as well. Thank you, Sunny. That sounds exciting, Dr. Paisan, and we are really looking forward to working with you on that. Now, I have a final question for you, Dr. Rajiv. What does the future of ARDA look like in India? India is a home for approximately 77 million people with diabetes, with the prevalence of diabetes being higher in the southern part of the country than in the other regions in India. Currently, there are several ad hoc screening programs being conducted, mainly by the private care providers, few charitable institutes, and a very few public health systems of the state. There is a need of a systematic, nationwide screening program for diabetic retinopathy in India. ARDA holds a great potential in playing a key role in the DR screening in our country, where there is a great mismatch, a very high load of people with diabetes and a significantly less number of ophthalmologists who can do it in person. That's incredible. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv and Dr. Paisan for joining us today and sharing the amazing work you are doing. Now, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Michael Howell, to share how we are helping consumers navigate the healthcare journey. It shouldn't surprise anyone to hear that three quarters of us turn to the internet first for information about health. We're looking up symptoms and conditions and researching prevention and treatments it makes sense, and we're in the middle of a global pandemic. But there can be a pretty big gap between the time you search for information and when you take action on the information you receive. To help close that gap, we're working with teams in Search and YouTube to help improve existing products. And at Google Health, we're developing online tools to empower you to take control of your health. As a doctor, I took care of patients for nearly 20 years, and I know this for sure. Informed and engaged patients have better health outcomes. Staying healthy and being informed is an ongoing journey. You typically start with searching the internet and discovering results. And then you evaluate the information and make decisions. And finally, you're left to take action. Everyone's path is different. That's why we're focused on programs and products to support your individual journey. A few of my colleagues will join me now to show you how to navigate and control your healthcare journey. Let's start with search. Here's Todd. One way we're empowering people along their health journey is by creating richer experiences across Google with clinically validated tools. For example, when people use Google search to find information on certain conditions, we're beginning to surface self-assessments based on questionnaires commonly used by care providers to evaluate patients at risk for certain conditions. These assessments are not diagnostic but they can serve as a way for people to learn more about a condition and any next steps. They're easy to find and easy to use. Let me show you how it works. When searching for COVID-19, you'll see a curated panel of information. If you scroll down, you will see, take a self-assessment. As COVID-19 spread, we were able to make available this CDC self-assessment that helped people understand their symptoms and advice on what they could do next. Since May of last year, the COVID-19 self-assessment has been completed more than 25 million times. We've also launched self-assessments for mental health conditions like anxiety, depression, PTSD, and postpartum depression, so people can better understand their risk and get connected to resources in collaboration with authoritative partners. Answers are private and secure. Google does not collect or share your private information from the self-assessment. When it comes to making decisions about seeking help, there's often a big gap between people first looking for information and seeking care. This is especially true for mental health conditions. Tools like this can empower consumers 
and help bridge that gap. And now I pass it over to my colleague, Divya, who is going to tell you more about how Google is helping with the next step of the health journey. Thanks, Todd. We know that healthcare is not one size fits all, that people's needs are highly individual. The search for care is inherently unique as everyone considers different factors to decide what's right for them or their loved ones. This is an area where we can help as a company that's centered around organizing information and making it useful. In the US, insurance coverage is one of the most important considerations in choosing healthcare providers. For instance, is the urgent care down the road in your network? In both search and maps, we're beginning to show new information about the insurance a doctor accepts, including Medicare. Since the start of the pandemic, healthcare is increasingly moving online. We have been helping people connect to care by responding to evolving information needs. Search interest in telehealth was up by 20-fold as shelter-in-place orders were made across the country. How do you know which doctors are doing virtual visits? We've made it easier to find telehealth providers in search, and we've given the doctors the ability to update their business profiles to reflect their virtual care options. When it's time to prepare for your in-person or virtual visit, we know it's important to plan ahead. Research shows that you'll get more out of your visit and that it can lead to better mental and physical outcomes. Being prepared often means knowing what questions to ask. So, Working with the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, we have developed a private and secure online tool that helps you create a checklist of questions. However, despite all of this, we also know that today not everyone has equal access to healthcare. Jacqueline, my colleague, who's also a practicing cardiologist, joins us now to share the work we are doing to improve access to useful health information for everyone. Thanks, Divya. When you think about health equity, what comes to mind first? Access to quality medical care? That's absolutely important. But socioeconomic factors like your zip code, education level, and income, they often have more to do with it. Those factors, along with your general environment, impact 80 to 90% of all health outcomes. I see this firsthand as a cardiologist who takes care of Medicare patients and the uninsured. Google can play an important role in helping to support health equity in three ways. First, we can make information accessible, understandable, and actionable for people of all health literacy levels. Next, when you have a health question, we want you to be able to find relatable information from trustworthy authoritative sources on search, YouTube, and other Google touch points. Third, we're ensuring that our features are built for everyone, regardless of your insurance, zip code, or education. Access to information can and should be the great equalizer. Google, through its products and services, can play an important role in supporting health equity. Thank you, Jacqueline, Divya, and Todd, for showing us what the teams are working on. It's clear that health is more than just healthcare. It's a result of what happens between our doctor's appointments. Our vision at Google is to support billions of healthier people and to build an ecosystem of trusted information that meets everyone's needs across the globe. We're excited about what's ahead, and we hope you are too. As you can see, over the past decade, there's been a huge leap in technology. Take the device in your pocket. It's built with advanced features like the sensor in your camera that can help us engage with the world in ways that can be used to improve your health. These new capabilities, along with more and more people having internet access, are fueling the next wave of health innovation. This leads me to share something we've been working on that will be available in the Google Fit app within the next few weeks. Joining us now is my colleague Shweta to tell us more about this innovative technology. Thank you, David. I've spent the majority of my academic research and product career exploring all the ways smart devices and the sensors within these devices can be used to improve people's health and well-being. As David mentioned, smartphone adoption is prolific, and recent advancements in 
mobile sensors that are in those devices coupled with AI technology means that you can do so much more with existing technology like using your microphone, camera, the accelerometer, the gyro, and other built-in sensors that we're seeing in mobile phones. Among the initial projects we've been exploring, we're excited to share with you the use of the camera phone to measure your heart rate and your breathing rate. Typically, you need specialized sensors or devices to measure these numbers. But today, we're excited to share with you the ability to measure both your heart rate and your breathing rate using this technology that will soon be available in the Google Fit app. The principle behind this technology is similar to a pulse oximeter that you might use at a doctor's appointment, which optically measures the change in cardiac volume at your fingertip. So the way this works is that as the heart is beating, the amount of blood getting to the fingertip changes and is related to your heartbeat. But recent advances in mobile phone cameras and computer vision algorithms allows us to see even the most imperceptible movements and color changes that happen on the human body. So instead of just looking at the fingertip, you can look at the face and detect that small change in color that tells you what your heart rate is. Similarly, the small movements related to your breathing can also be detected with these algorithms. There's been over a decade of basic science research in this space. But there were also engineering challenges that had to be addressed to make this technology easy to use and scalable across mobile devices. A critical part of our product development was ensuring that the algorithm performed well across a diverse population so this technology could be used by everyone. Working with several research sites, we validated our algorithm with hundreds of people across different ages, gender, skin color, health status, and even a variety of different lighting conditions. We'll first launch with select Android phones on the Google Fit app, but with plans to expand to more and more devices. While the sensor outputs are not medical diagnosis, they're still useful measures of fitness and health. So after you go for a run, you can quickly use the app to be able to look at what your heart rate is. The measures rely on the live video feed and the camera on your mobile phone, but you can choose whether or not to delete or save the measurements privately in your Google Fit app. With this milestone, our team continues to work on what else is possible with sensors and phones and other commodity devices. We've just scratched the surface and what we can do. Our team at Google Health is committed to advancing the field of mobile health sensing and its wide ranging applications for everyday health. We continue to advance health and wellness use cases by leveraging a variety of sensors, surfaces and applications also working closely with research and healthcare professionals in the community to ensure that these measurements are accurate and meaningful to people and healthcare workers. Up next, my colleague John Morgan will share a new build out on the Android platform that will help improve community participation in clinical research studies. Thank you very much, Swetek. Now, my name is John Morgan, and I'm the product manager for Google Health Studies. And joining me in this discussion today is Dr. John Brownstein from Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Welcome, John. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, the Google Health Studies Android app was launched in December and was created to make it easier for researchers to build digital studies and reach users. Now, our initial study on the platform is focused on respiratory health, which was developed in partnership with you. Can you tell us a little bit about why you were excited to get involved in this project? So as we know, mobile research is really hard and there are reasons for that. Bias in the populations we access, technology access, recruitment and retention of populations in these studies. So we were so excited that Android could allow us to access more diverse populations. I mean, we had the framework where we've been doing crowdsourcing for so many years but limited by the kinds of tools we were developing, like Outbreaks Near Me and Google Flu Trends. Some of that knowledge that we wanted to ask was out there, but we just didn't have the survey to design. And so that was what was so amazing of working with the Google Health team, is that we were able to start building this platform from scratch and get to the answers that we needed. One of the key features that they built was about patient reported outcomes. And so with this study, we were able to ask questions during the enrollment, and for instance, our first study was focused on asking participants about how they're feeling, about the vaccinations they're receiving, information on social distancing, and other precautionary measures on a weekly basis. 
Absolutely. And I think one of the features that pairs really well with these patient report outcomes is our data visualization. From day one, like data transparency is a foundational pillar for Google Health Studies, and users will always be will be able to see the data that they're contributing, as well as how their participation helps impact representativeness within the study. And as we all know, data and privacy go hand in hand. Yeah, absolutely, John. So from day one, privacy was a guiding principle of this work, right? So we could get powerful individual level contributions, but represent that at the aggregate population level. One of the major pluses was the passive data that could be collected from individuals related to their mobility. These are not forms of data that we generally have access to as clinical researchers. These mobile phones represent this incredible sensor that you can tap into, truly expands this concept of the digital phenotype, generally things that clinical trials have not been able to do. And so this is an amazing advance for us. Oh, absolutely. And, and so diving a little bit deeper, can you tell us a little bit about the respiratory health study and what you're hoping to accomplish? Yeah, of course. So we've actually been trying for many years to understand the dynamics of infectious disease spread in communities. We've been limited by engagement of consumers and the kinds of data that we collect. So even after a year into this pandemic, we still have huge gaps in our knowledge about understanding how to truly control this pandemic. Example, what drives community transmission? And so the concept of coming together and finally bringing these types of topics into a platform like this means that we can orient a whole research endeavor to, to start teasing these things apart. For instance, we want to know about how hyperlocal spread is contributing to the spread of this pandemic. In less than a month, we've been able to recruit over 7,000 participants and more joining each day. We're excited to be able to see what these data will tell us over the next year. For instance, what does this data tell us about pre and post vaccination? Or what about new strains that are emerging in communities? And I mean, John, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us today. And we're also really excited to see how the respiratory health study will grow and develop over these next 12 months. And as Google Health Studies looks to the future, we're happy to share that we've been currently developing our next study uh, focused on mental well-being. In addition, we're soliciting interest from researchers and participants alike to share the focus areas that they would like to see us expand into. If you're interested in sharing, please visit the link below. Thanks, John and Dr. Bronstein. It was great to hear about how the Android platform can help move medical studies forward. Thank you for joining us today to learn about the work that Google and our partners are doing to make healthcare information more accessible and useful. We're committed to helping patients better connect with their doctors and building tools that make a meaningful impact on health equity, even in the midst of a pandemic. To learn more and stay updated on our work, I invite you to follow us at health.google. Stay healthy and be well.